engine chill has started. And Dragon SpaceX, stand by for final go, but please confirm crew displays are configured for launch. SpaceX Dragon, crew displays are configured for launch. Stage one, RP-1 load is complete. Dragon is configured for terminal count, and Dragon's on internal power. Falcon tanks are pressurizing for strong back recheck. Strong back is retracting. Stage one lock loading is complete. Dragon is in terminal count.
stage two, lock floating is complete. Dragon is in auto idle. Gas closeout has started. Expect loud venting. Falcon 9 is in startup. Dragons in terminal count. Dragon, SpaceX, go for launch. Dragon, happy, go for launch. T minus 30 seconds. T minus 15. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Engine full power, and lift off. Go Falcon, go Dragon, go Crew 7. One alpha. Copy, one alpha. Two cool, switching down range. Stage one propulsion is nominal. Stage one throttle down. Stage one, throttle up. One Bravo. Copy, one Bravo. MVAC chill is underway. Stage one, throttle down. Main engine cut off. Stage separation confirmed. Copy, two alpha. MVAC ignition.
Dragon SpaceX trajectory nominal. Dragon SpaceX trajectory nominal. Acquisition of signal, Marina. Dragon SpaceX trajectory nominal. Dragon SpaceX trajectory nominal. Dragon copy. Stage 2, FTS has saved. Stage two in terminal guidance. Shannon. Copy, Shannon.
MVAC shutdown. Dragon SpaceX nominal orbit insertion. Dragon SpaceX Dragon Chappies nominal orbital insertion. Dragon SpaceX launch escape system disarmed. Dragon Chappies. Acquisition of signal, New Finland. Expected loss of signal cape stage two. Dragon separation confirmed. Crew 7, on behalf of the Falcon team, I'd like to welcome you to orbit, and we hope you enjoyed the ride on Falcon 9. Space travel is difficult, even though you make it look easy, so thank you for trusting us to get you up there. It's not a bad way to spend a day in the office. Stand by for words from the launch director. Hello, Crew 7. This is launch director here on Countdown. On behalf of the entire SpaceX launch and recovery team, I'm honored to welcome Dragon's first ever all international crew to orbit. Shisleva Puti, Gotor, Itera Shai. Godspeed, Crew 7. Cheers. SpaceX, uh, thanks for the ride. It was awesome. On behalf of Andy, Satoshi, Kochi, and I, we'd like to thank a multitude of people who brought us to this unique Bermuda. moment. We may have four crew members on board from four different nations. Denmark, Japan, Russia, and the USA, but we're a united team with a common mission. Uh, we hope the work do serve to benefit our beautiful home planet and those on it. As you said, human spaceflight requires an unparalleled level of vigilance and rigor, and we thank all those who prepared not only us, but also this truly impressive spacecraft for flight. Finally, to our families, carry the brave, greater burden of our choice to explore. Thank you. Go Crew 7. Awesome ride.
Dragon, delayed call, nominal dehumidifier activation, and service section Draco checkouts. SpaceX, Dragon, copy. Expected loss of signal, Newfoundland. Acquisition of signal, Coon Hilly.
And Dragon SpaceX, we saw a nominal nose cone opening, TCS and forward bulkhead Draco checkouts. Additionally, at this time, there's approximately three minutes left in this current ground station pass, and you are welcome to introduce your zero-G indicator. SpaceX, Dragon copies all. I'll hand it over to Andy. Well, I'd like to introduce our zero-G indicator, which was selected by my three children, Emily, Frederick, and Jacob. Tusind tak, Emily, Frederick, og Jacob. Jeg elsker jer, og jeg glæder mig til at se jer igen så meget. Children picked a three-toed sloth as our zero-G indicator. It's a three-toed sloth, not a two-toed sloth, and that's an important detail I'll get to later. Uh, they chose the sloth because it's one of their favorite animals. Uh, we were very fortunate on our last vacation to Costa Rica to see sloths in the wild, uh, especially one memorable occasion. One day we were at the beach when a sloth, a very young sloth, appeared in the trees above us and hung out um, the rest of the day with us. And it was just a very special moment for us as a family. Additionally, sloth is also what my children like to call me with uh, strong encouragement from my wife. Hey, I'm always uh, the last to leave the house whenever we're going anywhere. Personally, I think it's with good reason, uh, but they say I'm the slowest person alive, uh, which is also why it's a three-toed sloth, not a two-toed sloth, because apparently that would be too fast for me. So welcome to space, Sasha the Sloth. And Dragon, we appreciate the introduction to the your zero G indicator, and noting that that is uh, probably officially now the fastest sloth uh, ever. It, it, this is Satoshi. Uh, it's nice to be in space, and uh, I'm very glad to see happy faces. I'm very excited, first of all, a few words in Russian than in English. Всем большое спасибо огромное в восхищении тем, как мы прокатились на ракете, мы в космосе. Невероятно. Полет в космос – это результат действий скоординированных тысяч людей, которые работают в разных странах. Всем большое спасибо, большое спасибо. Роскосмос, НАСА. Lisa, Jax, uh, SpaceX, uh, my друзьям and family, thank you very much. Thank you very much for all your hard work. SpaceX, Roscosmos, NASA, ESA, Jax, and all the partners involved in manned space flight. That's a proud example of how much we can achieve working together in harmony. Let's continue. Cool. Thanks a lot to everyone, to my family as well. Thanks. SpaceX copies all. Thank you for the kind words. And Jaws, when you, if you are ready to copy, I do have some upcoming words on the phase burn. Expect a loss of signal. Good, Hilly. Six, Dragon is ready to copy. Okay, I wanted to give you an update that uh, we are going to be losing Tedris for voice comms for about 15, that's approximately one five minutes which is going to include that upcoming phase burn per your displays. We do have a ground station pass during that burn prep, so you will actually be able to call us in the blind. However, you will be LOS during the burn. There's no concerns, but we'll pick you back up at 0819 Zulu, which will be right after the burn, and we'll confirm that burn performance. How copy? SpaceX Dragon copies all. We'll leave, lose you on Tedris uh, for the phase burn, but we can make calls via the ground station in the blind, and we'll catch you on the backside at 0819. Good read back.
and Dragon SpaceX. The environments are looking good for suit doffing. We'll be taking the cameras external shortly. You are go for 4.012. Dragon, no response required. Cameras are external. SpaceX Dragon, com check on the cabin mic. And SpaceX has you 5x5 five five for the cabin mic com check. Okay, same.
throttle up. Good morning and welcome to NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida. I'm Jasmine Hopkins and you are watching the post-launch news conference for NASA's SpaceX Crew-7 mission. Early this morning at 3.27 a.m., a crew of four lifted off for the International Space Station. And this marks the first time in NASA's commercial crew program history that each crew member on board represented a different space agency. This was NASA's Jasmine Mugbelli, ESA astronaut Andy Mogensen, JAXA's Satoshi Furukawa, and Roscosmos cosmonaut uh, Konstantin Borisov. Joining us this morning is a distinguished panel of experts eager to talk to you about today's mission. Starting from my left, we have Ken Bowersox, Associate Administrator for NASA's Human Exploration and Operations Mission Directorate. Followed by Steve Stitch, Manager of NASA's Commercial Crew Program. Joel Montabano, Manager of the International Space Station Program. Benji Reed, Director of Crew Mission Management for SpaceX. Hiroshi Sasaki, Vice President, Director General of JAXA, and Josef Oshbacher, Director General of ESA. Our panel will be taking questions from the media on the phone and right here in the room, but before we get to you, they will each take a moment for opening remarks, and Ken, we'll start with you. Hey, thanks, Jasmine, and thanks everybody for joining us so early in the morning. Um, boy, what a beautiful launch. Uh, the seventh to the International Space Station, uh, and uh, with four international crew members. Uh, really uh, an exciting thing to see. Um, uh, we all uh, got an extra day in Florida. Uh, you, you probably remember we were gonna try yesterday. Um, uh, I was so proud of the team, the way they decided uh, to uh, take a little time to complete the analysis on one of the components um, uh, aboard the Dragon. Um, it shows how well our teams work together and the way they feel empowered to analyze the data and make sure our vehicles are really ready before they fly. Um, the, the safety of the crew is very important to all of us, and, uh, and, and it's really neat to see how well our SpaceX, NASA, and international team works to ensure that we're always ready. Um, the mission's just started. There are uh, many days ahead of the crew that just launched. Uh, they still have to dock the station. They've got a lot of exciting science to do while they're up there uh, aboard the station. And then uh, we need to get them home. And of course, we've got the Crew 6 return coming uh, after this crew reaches station. So we have plenty of excitement ahead of us and plenty of things that, that we need to pay attention to. Um, again, thanks uh, uh, one more time for being here with us this morning. I'm going to pass it over to Steve Stitch, our commercial crew program manager. Thank, thanks, Ken, and thanks for your interest this morning and coming to the briefing. Um, you know, we had a great launch today. The, the weather was about as good as it can get uh, here in Florida. I don't, I don't quite think I've seen the weather so good. The weather was great up the coast as well, so we were fortunate to take an opportunity to launch today. It's great to see Jasmine, Andreas, uh, Constantine, and Satoshi on orbit. The crew's doing well. They looked excited on orbit. And uh, you know, the rest of their day, there was a phasing burn that we did about 4.15 a.m. Eastern. There'll be another burn uh, tonight at 8.37 Eastern. And then the most of their day is you know, getting out of their suits. They'll get some time to take a nap, um, have a meal, and, and uh, do activities on Dragon. Um, we'll, we're setting up for uh, the docking. Um, you know, it's early Sunday morning. There'll be an approach initiation burn at about 7 a.m. Eastern time. It's about a 29-hour uh, journey to the space station this time, and docking would be about 8:39 a.m. Eastern on Sunday, so uh, a little over 29 hours from launch. Um, you know, we had a great countdown today, and I was very proud of our team. Uh, you know, the NASA and SpaceX team worked through a pretty challenging problem, and Ben Reed will talk more about that, but we had an indication uh, of some NTO vapor in one of the sensors that reads that vapor as it comes out of the service section. We needed to take our time and talk through that and make sure that we didn't have any significant uh, items going on with the prop system. The team did that. Uh, it was great to watch uh, Stu Keach of SpaceX in particular and John Posey from NASA work together and, and get through that problem today. And 
just to me, it's a, a tribute to the whole team and how we've grown uh, over the years of flying in space together between NASA and SpaceX. You know, it was a busy week, I would say, all the way back to the flight readiness review. Um, during the crew dry dress, we had an O2 sensor in Dragon that was a little erratic. It's one of five sensors used to measure the O2 as we inject O2 into the cabin and, um, and keep that oxygen level right. So we swapped out that sensor, checked that out, and got into the, the, the countdown later on. Um, we did delay one day uh, off of our original target, the 25th, and we took a little extra time. Um, SpaceX, out of uh, an abundance of caution, when we had the low flow prop isolation valve corrosion um, on the, the valves that we talked about at the flight readiness review, out of an abundance of caution, they went back and looked at every single valve on the vehicle and looked at a parameter we call force margin. And that really is the margin to open and close for a valve. And so they wanted to do that for all the valves. And it took a little bit more time to get through the ECLIS valves. And these are valves that inject uh, oxygen and um, air into the vehicle uh, to allow the, that cabin atmosphere to be at the right pressure and for the crew to have enough oxygen to breathe. And so we wanted to make sure that we understood that force margin for all the nominal cases and also any contingency cases that we might get into. And we did that over the last 24 hours, and I'm really proud of the team. We stood down at SpaceX's recommendation to take an extra time to look through that data. We had a mission management team today. We got through that data and all pulled to go to proceed, and so we got into the countdown today. Just super proud of our team. Uh, congrats to the NASA and SpaceX teams. I also want to uh, thank the international partners for their trust in the CCP program at uh, flying uh, all our crew members, and then also thank the U.S. Coast Guard, the Space Force, uh, the FAA, and all the agencies that we work with to make this flight happen today. And with that, I'll turn it over to Joel. Thank you, Steve, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, congratulations to SpaceX, our international partners, and all my NASA colleagues. What an outstanding launch and an awesome way to uh, start a, a Saturday morning. Um, you know, since we last talked, we had a progress launch, a Russian progress launch, and a Russian progress docking, and uh, that went all nominal. Uh, as Steve said, uh, this vehicle is going to dock uh, just after 8.30 Eastern on Sunday. Uh, hatch opening will be about two hours later. Uh, the vehicle will stay docked to the International Space Station for about 180 days. Uh, we'll have about a five-day handover with Crew-6. Now, the exact day when we undock will be based on weather. Uh, the other cool thing we're doing, as I mentioned earlier, is we're going to do a fly around, a fly around in the International Space Station and get some cool photos and, and get that out to everybody and show what an awesome outpost we have. Uh, during the 180 days on board, the team will do a lot of utilization and research. We have them fully staffed the whole time. Uh, the uh, way we've been operating space station is just maximizing the use of utilization research, technology development, et cetera, et cetera, in addition to the commercialization activities we do. Um, but looking forward, um, we have a Soyuz launch scheduled for mid-September, September 15th, and then a Soyuz landing on the 27th of September. Uh, that crew, when they come home, will be on orbit 300 and just over 370 days. With that, uh, again, a huge thank you to everybody, and I'll hand it over to Benji. Thank you, Joel. Um, <clears throat> as always, it's an honor to be here. Um, it's kind of mind-blowing. I think I've probably said that many times to believe that we've been here um, and, and having these conversations and be able to be with these great partners um, and friends through um, all of these adventures of sending um, astronauts to space and bringing them home safely. Um, uh, again, I think it's been said a number of times that how cool is it to think that we have our fully international crew on board Dragon. Um, um, it's, it's, it's really special, um, including, you know, our partners from Roscosmos and, and from JAXA and from ESA. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's a wonderful part of what we hope to do as a company, as SpaceX um, and all of our partnerships, ultimately to make life multiplanetary. Um, that means taking all of humanity and all of human life and, and, and helping us all be able to reach working together with
We've now gone to the space station 39 times. Um, we've flown 20 reflown dragons. Um, and altogether, we've flown 42 humans um, in space, um, which is pretty awesome. Um, I uh, want to kind of talk a little bit about uh, the process, what, what uh, St uh, Steve Stitch mentioned about the uh, NTO leak. Um, just as a reminder, NTO is one half of the hypergolic propellants that we use on Dragon. It's the uh, nitrogen tetroxide. Um, and uh, of course, these you, in any case, you want to make sure you're measuring the pressures and temperatures and any substances that, are, that you're concerned about whenever you're flying spacecraft. In this case, when we had uh, taken the, uh, moved the arm away, the, the crew arm away, um, we uh, got a measurement from a, an ex basically an outlet, an exhaust outlet from the service section, um, and that sensor measured um, a very little bit of NTO. Um, it was probably on the order of about a quarter of a part per million. So a, v a very tiny amount, but um, in an abundance of caution, of course, we wanted to ass assess that and understand why were we getting that reading at all. Um, so we stepped back, and, and as Steve talked about in, in close coordination with the NASA teams, we stepped back and, and assessed what that, you know, if, if it were really any kind of a leak, what would that mean? How much could it actually be? Um, the, uh, the teams did something like that, which was really cool. They actually um, sent three different engineers off to do the calculations, you know, with sort of the instructions to go work the calculations independently and don't talk to each other and come back and tell us what you would come up with. And so in the short period of time during the count, we, uh, the, the engineers did that, came back, and uh, independently all came up with the same number um, that basically uh, gave us the number of if there really were any leaking how much would that be over time, particularly over the course of the entire mission, assuming a 210-day mission on station, kind of the max. Um, and, um, and the good news was that the number that we came up with was well within the range of what you might normally see um, in any kind of system, you know, a little bit of leaking around seals and around closed valves anyway. So it was within that range. And it gave us um, over an order of magnitude, so over 10 times um, the amount of margin that we would uh, need to see against any kind of concern. So with those uh, three independent calculations in hand, um, the teams, you know, re-reviewed the data and agreed that we were go to launch. Um, it's that kind of a partnership with, with NASA and the international partners and within SpaceX and the engineering that we do to ensure that, you know, we take the astronauts to the station, get them there safely, and bring them home. On that note, it's important to note that we are mid-mission. Um, and the uh, astronauts are on their way to station. So for this first piece of the, the mission, we're still still underway, and, and so far, so good. Things are looking good. The crew is doing well, and Dragon is healthy. Um, it's also important to remember that we have another Dragon with crew on station. So as part of this whole process, when we send crew up, we need to bring more crew members home. So we're looking forward to bringing the Crew 6 crew home um, to their families um, safely um, in, in just a matter of days. Um, I think uh, really uh, that's, you know, again, it's, it's an honor to be able to take all of these people and, and take good care of them. Um, it's, it's, it's a great thing to have the support and to be able to support all these agencies. So again, thank you to, to NASA, um, to, to JAXA, to ESA and Roscosmos, and to the United States Space Force for all of their support and trust. And with that, um, I'll hand it over to uh, Sasaki-san. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, first, on behalf of JAXA, I'd like to uh, extend my gratitude to NASA, SpaceX, and international partners, and all the members who are uh, on the ground who devoted for the Crew 7 launch and continuous IS operations. As I reported earlier, the Crew Dragon was launched into the orbit or the plant. The mission is still ongoing, so though I'd like to congratulate all of you on the successful launch. It is uh, Great pleasure not only for me, but also Japan, that the Japanese astronaut board the Crew Dragon continuously and contribute to the ISS operations on orbit with international partners. I have no doubt that the Crew 7 mission is a symbol of solid international partnership. I do believe that the international partnership has been and will continue to be a key to bring enormous benefit um, available without the ISS. I, I believe that Satoshi will carry out a variety of the mi missions 
which includes uh, life and material and physical science and technology demonstration for future lunar exploration. His expertise cultivated in that space and on the ground will contribute to the success in these missions. And this is the first Japanese astronaut flight after the Japanese government committed its participation in the extension of ISS operation until 2030 and gateway implement arrangement sign uh, addressed the uh, Japanese astronaut to the uh, gateway. I'm confident that uh, Japan will conti continue to take a leading role in the human endeavor by making the best use of our expertise and expand the horizon of the space exploration with the international partners to bring benefits for all humankind. I'm deeply honored to witness the historical moment with you. Once again, congratulations on the successful launch. I pass the uh, ESA Director General, Jeff, Jeff Joseph Ashbaka. Mm -hmm. No, thank you. Thank you also from my side and congratulations. Uh, what a day. Uh, our four astronauts are on the way to the space station. It's really an exciting moment and uh, of course also on behalf of ESA. I really would like to congratulate all our partners but thank in particular NASA uh, and uh, SpaceX uh, for having achieved uh, uh, this uh, milestone and this uh, wonderful launch. Uh, of course, we are looking forward to the docking and uh, then, of course, the work of the astronauts uh, on the space station. Uh, for me, as uh, Director General, this is now the, first, uh, the fourth uh, astronaut launch uh, that I witness. Uh, I've been in office since a bit more than two years, and uh, we had quite a continuous presence uh, in the ISS. Uh, we had uh, Thomas Pesquet, we had uh, Matthias Maurer, uh, Samantha Cristoforetti uh, almost uh, continuously, and now with uh, Andreas Morgensen, uh, the fourth astronaut uh, uh, in a very short period of time. And this is really also showing that uh, Europe is committed, Europe is strongly engaged uh, in exploration. Uh, we want, of course, to even further increase our engagement because we want to be a good partner to our international partners uh, in uh, the ISS and uh, working together. So this is really a, a highlight uh, for us. Uh, All together, I've uh, just recently uh, read that uh, 269 astronauts since uh, 2000 uh, have been going to the space station from 21 countries, and I think this really shows also with today's launch uh, of four different nations representing four different agencies that this is really an international endeavor. And uh, for the part of Europe, I'm really very happy and very proud to say that uh, we are a strong partner in this uh, undertaking on the ISS, and uh, this is really a big honor, but also uh, a great pleasure to be a partner of uh, the space station. Andreas uh, Morgensen uh, is a and he's an astronaut, is one of our existing uh, core of astronauts. Uh, we have also selected a, a new uh, group of 17 uh, astronauts uh, just in November last year. So we're really increasing the, our presence uh, in the future uh, in space, uh, and this is uh, part of a wider uh, operation which we are planning in Europe. We call it Revolution Space, uh, which is uh, uh, an initiative, an activity where we want to be sure that uh, we are uh, delivering on our commitments uh, to the international community and that we are increasing and stepping up uh, our European activities in space. Andreas uh, will be the first non-American uh, pilot uh, of uh, the Crew Dragon, uh, and this is something that, uh, of course, gives us uh, great pleasure, but uh, also is, uh, is a sign of trust that the other uh, space station uh, uh, partners are putting on us, on ESA, and uh, Andy Morgensen in particular, and I really would like to thank our partners for having accepted uh, Andreas uh, to pilot the Crew Dragon on the way to the space station. It's, uh, it's a big deal for us, and uh, I really appreciate this honor, and uh, I'm very grateful for that. He will then, um, on the station, uh, presume or assume the commandership. Uh, again, this is something that uh, is uh, showing the trust uh, that uh, these uh, international partners put also in ESA uh, as a very strong partner in the space station. And let me really underline and highlight that we have many very active and strong activities uh, with NASA, with JAXA, uh, with the Roscosmos uh, uh, and on the space station that we are uh, conducting together, but uh, with uh, NASA in particular on the Artemis program, Mars sample return, and many other domains, and uh, with JAXA. Just yesterday we had a discussion on some of the international corporations which we're having. So this is really a sign and a symbol of how strong this partnership is in space. I'm very happy to see that. Uh, 
Andy will lead a, a number of science experiments. Uh, there are about 30 European experiments he will work on. Uh, ten of them are funded through the Danish government by Denmark, uh, through the ESA system. Uh, and they will focus on climate, health, and the application of uh, uh, space uh, for uh, for domains on, on Earth, uh, so for space applications uh, as we know it. Uh, examples are uh, to study atmospheric phenomena like uh, lightning, the impact of sun radiation through the well-known aurora, several health-related uh, experiments, uh, and technologies such as uh, 3D printing or virtual reality setups, uh, exercises which he will, he will conduct. Um, let me also say that uh, Andreas uh, Morgensen is very committed to sustainability, uh, biodiversity, and he is engaged as an ambassador with the Wild Nature Foundation and uh, Nature Conservation. Uh, and this is also reflecting the uh, domain of uh, climate change and the uh, green transition, which is a top priority for ESA, for Europe, and uh, Andy is uh, conducting and is working very strongly in this. A last word, uh, apart from thanking, of course, NASA, SpaceX, uh, Japan, and Russia uh, for this excellent cooperation. I would also like to say a, a word of thanks to my own teams in ESA. They have done a fantastic job to make this happen. Uh, every mission is uh, a major effort, and really a big thank you also from here, from Cape Canaveral, to my colleagues in ESA, either the ones that are here uh, at the Cape or the ones that are back in Europe working uh, to make this possible. And uh, this is something that is, uh, is really very nice to see, and thank you also from from that point of view, uh, to all my teams. Thank you very much. And thank you all for those opening remarks. This is certainly a global effort. Uh, so now we're going to open up the floor for questions. If you are joining us on the phone, please press star one to enter the question queue. And if you are joining us here in the room, please raise your hand and give us a moment to get a microphone to you. All right, let's take this question here in the front. Uh, Marcia Dunn, AP. A quick one for Benji and then an overall question. How much time did you have left to spare when that leak got cleared? I, it was unclear when that would, went away. And um, for everyone else, Frank Rubio and, and the Russian cosmonaut weren't supposed to be up there a year. So are there any plans to deliberately keep a Japanese, European, or a NASA astronaut up there for a full year to get more knowledge as you prepare for the moon and one day Mars? Thanks. Great, I'll, I'll start, thanks Marsha for the question. Um, it, it, it was low in the count. I mean, we were, we were working that problem and we cleared it, um, I think it was within the last two minutes of the count. Yeah. As far as uh, long-term astronauts, at this time, we're not planning any additional one-year missions. Uh, we are working with uh, the NASA Human Research Program and, and across the partnership on doing some experiments with the crew before they launch uh, to help uh, build a pr uh, collection of data such that if we did extend astronauts, we'll have that information such that we can use for future programs. But at this time, no additional one-year missions in the future. And also, maybe for ESA, for Europe, our plan is uh, to continue with the six-month uh, missions. Uh, so this is uh, what is, of course, uh, planned now with, uh, with Andy, but also for the next assignments. All right, thank you so much. Uh, did, would you like to add? And I was just gonna add that um, our uh, science team would like to see more one-year missions. So we're always looking for ways that we might be able to, to make that happen. But as Joel mentioned, we don't have any scheduled right now. Okay. Great, thank you all so much. Uh, we have a question right next to Marsha as well. Hi, it's uh, Bill Orr with CBS News, and this is kind of a question for Benji and for uh, uh, Steve Stitch. Uh, and Benji, I appreciated the explanation of the N2O problem, because whenever you hear N2O on a loop, you get kind of antsy about that if you know anything about N2O, right? Um, and Steve, you know, you mentioned the valve problem you guys had. M my question is this. I do not understand, and I think a lot of reporters have the same feeling. I don't understand the lines of authority for telling reporters what's going on with a SpaceX rocket. And what I mean is, when you guys scrubbed the launch the other night, it took an hour, you know, before a one, two sentence statement came out that just said you scrubbed. It didn't say why, it just said you scrubbed. I mean, bus drivers were saying you were scrubbed, okay? So, I mean, I don't understand the delay, how many people apparently have to sign off on one of these things, okay? And then when the, when the release came out later in a blog about what that valve problem was, Steve, it was incomprehensible. I mean, if you go back and read it, 
There's no way you understood what was going on with it, and yet you delayed the launch day because of this, which means there's some seriousness to it or you wouldn't have delayed, right? I don't understand the, the, the flow of information, and everything we hear out here is, well, NASA can't talk about a SpaceX rocket because it's their rocket. I get that. You know, SpaceX, you know, delays a Star Wars launch and just says we're delayed. They don't tell you anything about it. It's their rockets, their payload, and that's fine. But, but a taxpayer-funded mission with NASA astronauts on it, it's almost, it's like pulling teeth to get information. And I don't understand who has authority to tell us what. Do things have to all go through SpaceX? Or, or does NASA PAO have any ability to tell us in real time when something like it's scrubbed? I mean, that's basic. That's like the sun is up. So I'm, I'm sorry if I sound agitated, but this is, this has just been building, and I don't think I'm alone out in the reporter community to, to talk about these things. It's very frustrating, and it's hard to get information. And I say that even though, Benji, whenever you come to one of these news conferences, you tell us more than we need to know. I mean, I'm not complaining about what you tell us. I'm complaining about when we get told, okay? So I'll stop there. I could, I could talk for a while, but anyway, go ahead. I'll start. We, we probably could have done a better job of getting out a, a release uh, when we delayed the launch yesterday. I, I'll take the hit for that. We. We were in the middle of a, a Dragon mission management team, and we could have done a better job at saying, hey, we've just scrubbed for 24 hours. And the, the valve problem, I'll talk a little bit about the, uh, the, the life support valves. It, it was really, no kidding, we wanted to take the extra time. And so if our blog wasn't comprehensible, I, I'll try to do a little better job of explaining it. Uh, again, when we had the issue with the stuck valve on the CRS-28 cargo flight, we stepped back between SpaceX and NASA and wanted to look at all the valves across the vehicle, not only the prop valves, but also the ECLIS valves. And we were working through that assessment just to better understand. We certified the vehicle at NASA many years ago that we have a requirement that says on every valve you have to have a force margin of 25%. That means open and close force that's required to close that valve, you ought to have a little bit more force in, in reserve in case something happens and you can't close the valve. These valves are very critical for putting oxygen in the system and nitrogen in the system, keep the cabin pressure where it is, and when the crew breathes, you have to replace that oxygen. So we weren't quite sure we understood the force margin, and, so, and, and we didn't have all the analysis done, and so we said, hey, let's stand down for 24 hours and make sure we understand it before we go fly, because we wanted to understand the risk to the crew, and so we did that. And, that's what we tried to say in the blog, basically, is we needed a little more, more time. There was no problem, and this is a little different than most of our uh, scrubs, where there's a problem with the vehicle, where we know we have uh, a problem with an engine or uh, a component on the vehicle. This was different in that Dragon was doing fine at the pad, Falcon 9 was doing fine at the pad, but we really just wanted an extra little bit of time to go through and, and assess that uh, that situation with the ECLIS valves. And so we tried to put out a blog relatively soon when we got done with our meeting and could look at the steps going forward. And I think we ended up putting it out probably close to 2 a.m. Eastern time. So we can do a little bit better. But again, in terms of authority, I mean, we worked together with NASA and SpaceX to determine you know, the next launch attempt and what the course of action is. And I would say we probably could have done a better job of getting the notice out that we scrubbed. And, and, and Bill, I, just, I just thank you for your feedback. I think it's important that we that we hear feedback and we understand because I, you know, as as a taxpayer and and, and all of us, we, we want to make sure that we are providing the right information. So, but I will say for sure that we are uh, a joint team. Just in just as we do in the execution, the missions, the operations, um, I am always pleased with how our comms team and PAO work together and. Steve and, and his team and all of our team at SpaceX work really hard to, to make sure we're getting the right data out there. But we appreciate that feedback very much. Thank you for those answers. Uh, questions again here in the front on this side. Hey, good morning. Aaron Cooper with CNN. Can you talk to me a little bit about the valves? The, did anything need to be changed? Were there any problems associated with them? Or was everything nominal? I, mean, I understand this was just understanding the forces required it, no changes forecast based on that information. Um, nothing was oiled, for example, or anything like that. Uh, and when in the process did you realize you were going to run out of time on this analysis? Okay, great. So uh, the first question about the valves. Yeah, at, at this point, yeah, we, we cleared all of the valves on the Dragon, on both Dragons that are in space right now. 
So that, that, that's really the critical piece, right? Before we go launch this, the current Dragon Crew 7 Dragon, we want to make sure that, that we had scrubbed the data. And to make sure everybody understands, what we're really talking about is going back into all of the test data, all the analysis, you know, for the system in general as a design, but also specifically looking at each valve and each of its acceptance testing to really make sure, did, do we, are we clear about the margin that we have for all of those? So really this is a, a data scrub, if you will, a, a records scrub. So I go through and make sure absolutely that we've, that we've checked it all. Um, given that, that we were able to clear that, all of that information and all of the testing that had gone in at the component level and then the subsystem, the system, the vehicle level, all that testing that led up to it, we were able to clear the whole vehicle. And, and, and therefore didn't have to go do anything, oil the valves. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's, um, that's, it's a good question. I don't foresee us needing to go um, make any changes, at least at this point in the future. And if for the record, I think it's important to understand, we also do that for the Dragon on station, right? Because we also have to make sure that we clear those valves and clear that vehicle so we can bring that crew home safely. Um, in terms of coming into the count, I, you know, our, our launch director, actually, after the operation was all over, after we got the crew to safely to space, um, our launch director, was I was chatting with him, and um, he said something really great, um, which is, you know, we, we weren't trying to solve that problem in order to launch. That's worth repeating, right? We, we're not trying to solve that problem so we can launch. That's, and so when our engineering teams and our leadership teams and our operation teams are working an issue in real time with the count, the count doesn't matter. It matters so that we're aware of where we are when, when do we need to make a call, right? In this case, this was kind of binary. It's either do we have the data that assures us that we're safe to launch or if we don't. If we didn't, great, that's okay. We'll stand down and try another day. If we have the data, great. But the efforts of the team is never in the direction of, well, we gotta go launch. They, they're working the problem to make sure we're safe. And then, if that's worked in the time frame, then we go, then we can launch. Um, and in this case, you know, we're able to, to, to take it down basically to, um, to it low in the count, you know, within a few minutes of the count, and that was, that was okay. Really, that's plenty of time based on what we needed to know, because at any point we can call, call the launch. Hopefully that helps. Thank you, yeah. Thank you for that answer, Benji. Uh, back here in the room, we have somebody in the second row, the center here. Yusuke Tomiyama, the Yomi Shimbun, Japanese Daily. Uh, my question is to Mr. Montalban. Uh, regarding the ISS extension, in April, NASA announced that U.S., Japan, Canada, and the ESA agreed to continue the ISS operations through 2030, while Russia confirmed that it would support continued the station operations through 2028. 20, so there seems to be a gap of two years. So how can we understand this gap and how do you make up this gap? So I'll, I'll start that. So, you know, I'll, everybody asks that same question. And so let me help you answer it. Uh, the way Roscosmos does their work, they do in four year increments. And so we were all agreed to 2024. Roscosmos did 2024 to 2028. Um, the important thing is we all extended past 2024 and we'll work together. As we get closer to the end of the decade, the partnership will continue to meet and we'll look at what makes sense. Um, as you know, NASA is in the process of developing the commercial LEO destinations. At this time, we don't want a gap in low Earth orbit. And so if those commercial LEO destinations are ready to go, then it'll be time to retire space station. If they're not ready to go, then the partnership will sit down, talk together, and do whatever we can such that we don't have a gap in low Earth orbit. Thank you, Joel. Any other questions here in the room? We have in the very back there, if we're able to get somebody, the microphone in the back, thank you. Hi, Will Robinson Smith, Space Flight Now. A uh, question for Benji Reed and potentially Steve Sitch. Um, I know progress is continuing on with the development of the crew tower for Pad 40. 
when is it first expected to be used for a crewed mission and what are some of the benchmarks between now and then? Thanks. Great, uh, thank you, it's a great question. Um, so uh, as it, just the, the context of course is that we're working on uh, uh, adding the capability to fly Dragon missions um, uh, from uh, Pad 40. That's uh, bringing it back to Pad 40, right? Because that's where we started from, which is pretty cool. Um, and uh, that, you know, we're looking at bringing that, that uh, capability online, um, you know, towards the end of this year, early next year is where I think we're aiming for. Uh, the, the bottom line though is that it'll always be a, a, a great uh, backup option and sort of a relief valve, if you will, um, from a manifest viewpoint. So if for whatever reason, you know, we, we need to you know, man manage a priority Dragon mission um, and we've got a conflict on pad 39A, um, or for whatever the reason we need, to, we were not able to fly out of 39A, then, um, then we could use pad 40. Um, as you probably notice on our manifest, pad 40 is a real workhorse pad. That's where a ton of our launches are going out of. So the ultimate goal would be to continue what we do. But you're also probably noticing that we're you know, flying more missions out of 39A, especially Falcon Heavy missions. So it'll be nice to have that as a backup or a relief valve. Um, and, um, but, on, but currently there's, there's not a specific mission to target to say, oh, we're gonna fly this specific mission out of 40. Um, we'll see when it comes up to when we need it. But uh, we've been working closely with NASA um, and our internal teams to, uh, to make sure we have that capability ready. And I, I would say from my perspective, I went uh, over to the hangar earlier this week and got to see the, a lot of the segments for the tower. SpaceX has done an incredible job of getting those segments together. I think you'll start to see it look a little bit like a crewed uh, tower pretty soon here toward the end of this calendar year. Uh, once the, ta the pad is built out, we have the crew access tower there, then we have a, from a NASA perspective, we have a certification process we have to go through for the various components uh, on that pad for the crew access tower, the crew access arm, and then the various systems on that pad, which are a little different than 39A. And, and we'll be working through that with SpaceX in later this calendar year and then into next year. And then, as Benji said, when we'll, we'll look at the manifest later on, and it'll be great to have that capability. I suspect we'll start. Um, one good thing is not only can we fly uh, crew dragons from there, we can fly cargo dragons for Joel as well. And I suspect we'll start with the cargo flight uh, on the NASA side. We haven't really picked out which one that will be yet, but we'll start with the cargo flight. And then if we need to later on, do a crew flight. Thank you for that answer. Anyone else here in the room? Ken Kramer. Ken Kramer, Space Up Close. Thanks, congratulations on a great mission. We just picked up our cameras, everything looks great. Um, so I missed most of the briefing. But uh, Josef Aschbach, let me, let me ask you, what's the future of uh, ESA astronauts on these commercial dragons? You had three in a row earlier, and now you have Morganson. What, what, what is the future? Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, what is the future? Um, so thanks for, for the question. Uh, what we have is, um, uh, as you know, we have a partner agreement uh, with NASA to fly our astronauts on the space station. Uh, that means we, we are contributing to several uh, aspects of the space station or the Artemis program, uh, which uh, gives us the, uh, the astronaut flights. Uh, so we have uh, six uh, flights uh, planned before the end of uh, this decade. Uh, we are, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, uh, we have a new um, uh, batch of astronauts uh, in training. Uh, we have selected 17, uh, the last uh, ministerial in November last year. Five of them are in training right now uh, as uh, future, as next astronauts, and they are the most likely candidates to then go to the ISS. So what would be the next flight for ESA astronauts? Uh, it's not yet. Uh, Six months. Yeah, it's not yet decided. So now we have uh, Andy Morganson in orbit. Uh, it's not yet decided, uh, but uh, of course we have first to train the existing ones, so the five that are in training. Uh, they are, they've just started in uh, April uh, this year. Uh, it takes about one year for the, for the base training. Uh, then uh, if the astronaut is selected for a specific mission, it takes another almost a year for training. So you already see that we are having a small gap here between Andy and uh, the next ones to come. Uh, the date is not fixed yet, but it's probably in the uh, N25, early 26 time frame. Thank you, Yosef. Back to the room. 
All right, well, not seeing any more hands raised, I think that will uh, wrap us up this morning for today's briefing. Uh, thank you so much to our panel for being here this morning and for the media who stayed up uh, late or early uh, to help us cover this mission. Crew 7 is now on its way to dock to the International Space Station, and it should arrive there at 8.39 a.m. on August 27th. A live joint coverage of docking and the Crew 7 welcome ceremony is scheduled for 6.45 a.m. on NASA TV and SpaceX's YouTube channel. Again, thank you all for joining us this early morning. And until next time, go NASA, go SpaceX, and go Crew 7. <laughs>